Hi guys, it's Professor Fernandez, and I'm here to do the lecture on the uh, last speech that Dr. King ever gave in his lifetime called I See the Promised Land. Now, you probably already saw the lecture from Dr. Claiborne about this piece. I'm not going to step on his toes. His lecture is amazing. Um, there is nothing that he said that I can touch on and expand on. I'm actually going to talk more about how to look at this piece rhetorically and how to kind of dissect and analyze this piece a little bit deeper. I'm going to start off by talking about the context of this piece. Not so much the Poor People's Campaign, which the Southern Christian leadership was about to start here at the time of this speech, but more about um, the when of this speech. The speech was given definitely the night before he died. It's known, of course, as the mountaintop speech. I've seen the mountaintop um, and I've seen the promised land and I've seen the glory of, of God. The eyes of my eyes have seen the glory of God. And so this is the part of the speech that everybody takes out of context. There is a whole other speech here where he's talking about many things but it's the last paragraph that's always taken out of context. And one of the reasons why, as you've learned in Dr. Claiborne's lesson, is that he died the very next day. He was assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel. And of course, this speech was recorded and that particular paragraph was very eerie because it almost forecasted his death. And other parts of this particular speech do the exact same thing. He, there's a lot of eerie foreshadowing, so much so that I even wrote the word eerie in my marginalia for this particular piece. Another thing of context to keep in mind, um, and this came as I thought about when I was recording this, I'm recording this particular lesson on the anniversary of his death, April 4th. Today is also Easter. So I looked up Easter from 1968. When was Easter 1968? And it was two weeks after his death. In addition, Passover was one week after his death. So we have someone of the cloth, someone who routinely talks about religion, talks about God in his work at a church, Mission Temple, or Mason Temple, I should say, talking about his role or what he has seen as a God-given role or he has been called to do, something that he's been called to do in the shadow of Easter and Passover. And I say this because there's a lot of God in here. <laughs> there's a lot of God in this particular speech. Even more so, I would say, than any other speech that we've studied this semester. There's a lot of metaphors from Bible stories. He's using Bible stories as evidence, anecdotal evidence. So there's a lot of biblical references, a lot of God here as well. And it's very, again, eerie, knowing that this is the last public speech he would give in his lifetime. So I'm looking at it through that particular context, right? I'm also wanting to talk about his greatest hits. We've studied Dr. King this semester and we have seen him in different eras of his life. Uh, challenges facing a new era was at the beginning of his work. It was still in the 50s. He was trying to understand nonviolence and that work of nonviolence. We've read Letter from Birmingham Jail, one of the couple of times he's been jailed for demonstrating or planning a demonstration. He's in Birmingham, Alabama. A couple weeks after is the bombing of the church uh, where the four little girls are um, killed by Klan members because of the bombing. Then we have him taking the world stage and accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. And now we have him at the end of his life talking about 
pretty much everything that we've seen him try to put together. He is not at the beginning when he's trying to understand kind of what his role is. We understand that he did not want a ministry that was similar to his father's ministry. He went to Boston and got his doctorate um, knowing that when he returned, that he did not want to be the same type of minister that his father was. He saw his ministry being very much about social justice, social awareness, doing better for African-Americans or Black people in America, understanding that segregation needed to be battled, but it needed to be battled in a certain way. And he was trying to find answers. You saw him quote philosophers. You saw him trying to understand the work of Gandhi, visiting Gandhi, trying to understand the nonviolence movement, trying to understand what is a just law versus an unjust law and the consequences of not following a an unjust law, a man-made law versus a moral law. You see him apply these theories throughout his life, but this right here is a speech where he is not trying to apply anything. He knows the answer. He understands what the answer is, what his role is in this answer, what his role is of everyone in this particular answer and the role of religion in the answer to end segregation and to essentially free Black people in America. And by freedom, we don't, we're not talking that they are enslaved, but they are enslaved by Jim Crow laws, but to be a full, a full citizen of the country. And so we see him not trying to work things out, but giving action plans. And so the entire essay, those who have never read this and just gone with the mountaintop part are missing out like the best part where he is literally giving action plans to everyone about what's going on. Yes, that this is um, kind of almost an announcement or a hint or an allusion to the poor people's movement. And I'll let Dr. Claiborne talk about the poor people's movement. This is something that him as the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was very well aware of, and this was the next phase of their work. And so he has a lot of ideas here about economics and the economic strength, the black dollar in America. This isn't the first time he's talked about this. He talked about this way back in the in late 50s in the challenges of a new era. He talked about these exact same ideas. The difference between Dr. King in the late 50s and Dr. King in the late 60s at the at the end of his life is that he's not trying to pontificate anymore. He's giving actual action plans to the people who are listening to his audience here. Now, I apologize, my window is open back, back behind me and my sister is actually mowing the lawn. So I, I'm hoping you can still hear me. All right. So let's talk about these action plans that he was, he was discussing here. I'll, I'll skip the first part where he's doing these illusions. I'm going to come back to these because the reasoning behind here, and again, the reasoning is how the argument is put together, is very on trend for Dr. King. He does this um, very much in Letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, so there's not anything too terribly new, but I do want to point those out when I'm done. We have here on page 196 in this book, by the way, the beginning parts of his marching orders. I'm going to call them marching orders or action plans here because it's this essay is different. It's different from Letter from Birmingham Jail. It's different from the Nobel Prize winning speech. It's different from the challenges of a new era. Again, he was trying to work things out or he had the world stage where he had to say certain things or he wanted to say certain things, I should say. But this is pretty much a plan of action. So he says here, and all of this, and that's all this whole thing is about, 
we aren't engaged in any negative protest and in any negative arguments with anybody. We are saying that we are determined to be men. We are determined to be people. We are saying that we are God's children and that we don't have to live like we are forced to live. He continues. Now, what does all this mean in this great period of history? It means that we've got to stay together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. So he's asking for all those specifically who have been forced to live a certain way. Note that he didn't say all black people. He didn't say all followers. He said all people have been forced to live a certain way to join together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. This can only be done together. It can't be done separate. The work has to be as one or not at all. He continues um, to talk about more things here. And he gives more marching orders uh, on page 198. Now, the other thing we'll have to do is this, always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. He talks about here about economy being power, the economics of, thing, of things. It's not about marching anymore. It's not about sitting at lunch counters. It's now about hurting people where they think it's the most important. It's their wallet. And it's not just their wallet, but the future of their wallet as well. And so this is very interesting. He said this before in the challenges of a new era. Um, he's talked about the economy, but he's talked more about the economy in that black people should have well-paying jobs or they should have the opportunity to earn well-paying jobs. He talked about it this way. This is where he's talking about it in the external. He's talking about it as a boycott. It's not the first time he's talked about a boycott. He's talked about boycotts many times in many essays, in many speeches. But this is where he talks about with, withholding the black dollar. And he talks about um, people un needing to understand that together, the black dollar is worth more than people think. Let's continue on to page 199 here. And he's got big, huge blocks of sections of action. And again, action is marching orders. This is what we need to do. Like, we ain't playing anymore. It's not about marches. We've, this is 2.0. 2.0 means we hit him in the wallet. And so he talks about it here. He says, and so as a result of this, we are asking you tonight to go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. Go by and tell them not to buy Sealist milk, tell them not to buy, what is that other bread? Wonder Bread. And the other bread company, Jesse, tell them not to buy Hearts Bread. As Jesse Jackson has said, up to now, only the garbage men have been feeling pain. Now we must kind of restitute the pain, redistribute the pain. We are choosing those companies because they haven't been fair in their hiring policies. And we're choosing them because they can begin the process of saying they're going to support the needs and the rights of those men who are on strike. And then they can move on downtown to tell Mayor Loeb to do what is right. He continues on to say, but not only that, we've got to strengthen black institutions. I call upon you to take your money out of the banks downtown and deposit your money in Tri-State Bank. We want a bank in movement in Memphis. More action plans. Now, these are the practical things we can do. We begin the process of building a greater economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. I ask you to follow through here. All right. Again, very eerie. <laughs> very eerie, knowing that he's going to die the next day. But these ideas aren't exactly new ideas. Again, um, these are ideas that he's actually put together. He's at the height of his work on, on social issues of this civil disobedience. He's at the height of his work. Um, and he's literally saying, all right, if marshes won't work, then the dollar work. 
the dollar will work because people respond to dollars. People respond to their money being threatened. So he continues on, we may not be in strike on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. And he talks about developing a dangerous unselfishness. And he continues talking about this action plan. And the action plan is either all together or not at all. We all do this or no one does this. And if we all do it, we will have a result. If only a couple of us are doing it, it's like none of us is doing this. And so no one knows to do it or nothing will come from it. So these are direct action plans. I want to shift a little bit and talk about uh, page 201. We start using the rhetorical question. He's used the rhetorical question a couple of times in building his argument here. But I, he reuses it really nicely here in the middle of page tw uh, 2001, or sorry, 201. He says, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? He continues talking about an all for one type of idea. If we don't stop and help the people next to us, what will happen to them? The question isn't what will happen to us. That shouldn't be the question. We already know that answer. The answer we don't know is what will happen to that person. Because one day we will be the person that needs help. And, the, and we hope that that person who's helping us will ask that same question, what will happen to them? So he adds this rhetorical question in the middle of all this argument. And so he has a lot of declarative goals here dealing with economy of course but really dealing with an all for one either we all reach this mountaintop or we fall off this cliff there is no in between and that is a very really cool use of logos here right logos of course is logic but there's also logical statements and logical statements are very if then that type of statements if it rains tomorrow, then I will use my raincoat. Logic. If we reach the mountaintop, if we do this together, then this will happen. If we don't band together, then this will happen. And that is an example of logos. It's a very sophisticated use of logos because there is no middle ground. There is no, oh, well, if some of us do it, then we'll get half the result. He doesn't say that at all. It's either all or nothing. And so his logos is very, very clear. And he keeps harping on it and harping on it and harping on it almost on every page, almost every other paragraph in this particular speech. Let's go back to the beginning where we have um, this foreshadowing. And this is one of the very first foreshadowings where I thought it was very eerie. It's the second paragraph here after he thanks everyone for coming and seeing him. He says, I'm delighted to see each of you here tonight in spite of a storm warning. You, you revealed that you are determined to go on anyhow. Something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening in our world. How about them storms, right? It's very eerie. Um, wow, I, there's nothing to say other than, did he know? I keep going back, did he know? And I'm not even sure if that's the right question to ask of this particular speech. Um, maybe not did he know, but how much did he suspect that he wouldn't be there when we needed to do this work, right? Maybe he understood that his work was beyond him and this can only happen or this work can only continue if other people take on the tor torch, but there can't be one more person who leads, everyone has to lead, right? And maybe that's the idea here that he's trying to get across. The idea of, you know, I'm 39 years old. I have been threatened many times. I've been stabbed a couple of times. I've been stabbed, I've been put in jail. Anything could happen. But you need to understand that this work cannot end with me. It is beyond me now. It's up to you to continue it. Regardless of what happens to me, 
it's up to you to do this work. And he leaves us with plans of action from a lifetime of thinking about it, of doing the work, of researching, considering. So I think it's kind of, um, maybe that's why it's so eerie. Maybe that's why the foreshadowing here makes me pause a bit. Um, because it feels like it's foreshadowing his death when in reality, it's probably an opportunity. He probably saw this as an opportunity to involve people in a different way, not in a passive way, but in an active way and to give them a marching order other than marching, right? To make, to bring the movement into a 2.0 or a 3.0, to make it more sophisticated. As times change, the movement has to change. And perhaps that is what Dr. King wanted in this, in this speech. Um, that is just my theory. My evidence is here, but I'm not doing a paper, you are. So let's keep going. There's lots of allusions here. He talks about Martin Luther, him being named um, after Martin Luther. You don't know who he is, Google him. It makes sense. Um, there's lots of parallels between Martin Luther and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, almost eerie as well. He also does a lot of ethos here invoking the great names. He invokes, of course, Martin Luther. He invokes um, FDR um, call, saying that, um, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even come to up to the 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come to come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Of course, that is FDR. Um, and of course, we know all the stuff. So he's invoking great people. And of course, he's doing this in the context of if he had to ask the creator, um, or if the creator asked him um, what age would he like to live in, he went like all historical. He went from Egypt all the way to now, right? And even, well, now for him would be the 60s. And so he, he talked about pretty much the big, the big things that were happening, right? He does this exact same thing later on in the speech. He, um, he, he does it when he articulates essentially everything that has been going on. He talks about this at the bottom of 196. He says, we aren't going to let any may stop us. We are masters of our nonviolent movement in disarming police forces. They don't know what to do. I've seen them so often. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in that majestic struggle there we could move out of the 16th street baptist church day after day and he continues and continues it's a long sentence of course and he talks about bull connor so he he adds this and he, he talks about this is what, what we've been through like we've we've been through the fire we have been baptized by this fire of this social movement of this social justice movement there's nothing we can't do if, as long as we stick together again with the theme of togetherness, all together or none at all. So this particular part of the reasoning adds to that logos that he continues to come back to. That logos is now becoming the theme of this particular speech. It's not the mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. That's just the last paragraph, my friends. The actual theme or I would even go as far as a motif of this particular speech is that we do this together. It's not just my movement, it's the movement of the people. Together the people moves, not Dr. King. It's a people movement. And we do this together with economy. By dollars, by, that's what he means. Okay, I like this idea here. Um, Going back to the beginning again, this idea of Pharaoh, this idea of Egypt. Um, Go Down Moses played in my head as I was reading this. If you've never heard of that song, you should probably Google it. It actually is a Negro spiritual. 
go down Moses, uh, way to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Those are the lyrics. And so I, I've, I heard that and he talks about um, Pharaoh and Egypt here on page 196. That's a heavy, heavy page, by the way. Um, this is a page you may want to spend a little bit of time on. He says, you know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves got together, something happens in Pharaoh's court and he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. When the Pharaohs got, get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Now let us maintain unity. Again, hitting that unity, hitting that togetherness theme, that motif, that's how he's building his argument. That's the reasoning that he's doing, but he's explaining this. He has this metaphor, and then he talks about all the things that were happening in Alabama. He talks about Bull Connor. This is not the first time we've heard that that name, Bull Connor, of course, um, in Alabama, who essentially uh, trying to remember if he was a governor. Or trying to remember what his position was i forgot but he was some, some muckety muck of course um and um tried very hard to extinguish the movement in birmingham and he likens bull connor to pharaoh and likens the movement and the members of the movement to slaves um the egyptian slaves and something happens when the slaves get together Pharaoh can't control them because they are unified. So he uses, that's an example of, by the way, of evidence. It's an example of anecdotal evidence. Evidence comes in two forms, of course. It comes in data, numbers, charts, statistics. Those are easy. Then it comes in anecdotal evidence. And anecdotal really means it's a story. Um, usually your metaphors or your similes um, happen in anecdotal data or anecdotal evidence. Um, and this is an example of it. He's using anecdotal evidence saying, hey, this is what happened in Egypt. Now, let me liken this to what's, what has happened so far. And every time we get together, progress happens. So there's no pharaoh that can contain us as long as we are together. So he's, again, building that argument. He's using logos to build that argument. He is using, of course, reasoning because he's putting that argument together. How the argument is put together is reasoning. And he is using anecdotal evidence here to do that as well. Metaphor as part of anecdotal evidence for those who love metaphors. And I think that's it. That's all I wanted to touch on. There are other things here, but I will let you find all those wonderful tidbits here. Of course, you know, I have lots of marginalia, um, but I'm only, I don't want to make this a long, a long um, video. Sorry, I am going to make a long video. One more, page two, 202. Adding to his reasoning, of course, Dr. King is fantastic with the rhythm of things. He's very fantastic with the rhythm and the repetition of things. And he, we've seen him do it in Letter from Birmingham Jail. And he does it, especially at like the pinnacle and the climax of that particular letter when he's talking about Funland and taking his daughter to Funland. And you see that huge paragraph is just practically one sentence, right? Here he does this at the end. So I notice how sophisticated that is and how much he's grown as, as a writer, as, as someone who does speeches, as someone who talks about his argument all the time. That particular repetition, of course, repetition in Letter from Birmingham Jail happens throughout, but that particular rhythm of the repetition happens almost in the middle of it. It just climaxes and goes down, climaxes and goes down. Here, he saved all that for the end, right before that last paragraph that everybody knows about. He starts in two, on 202, and I want to say to you tonight, I want to say that I'm happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I, would have been, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters and I knew they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and making the whole nation 
or taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which are dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, that rhythm, that rhythm, that rhythm. And he puts it at the end. And so this is kind of the building of the climax to that mountaintop speech, that last paragraph that everybody has heard whenever you pull up a clip of Dr. King doing a speech it's either the I have a dream speech or the mountaintop speech um I am not fearing any man my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord right that's the last one and he like walks off mic drop it's like the best mic drop I think I've ever seen in the 60s um and Bob's your uncle right so he has this and this part of the reasoning or the building of this argument happens at the end rather than at the beginning. He's already kind of hammered his idea of unity. Together we will get this done. And he's just like, now let me remind you what we've been through. This is where we are, (laughs) right? Had I not been here, I wouldn't have seen the work that you have done. None of this is work that, he, none of this is what he mentions that he has done. This is all work that has been done. He doesn't mention, if I had sneezed, I would not have been here. I would not have done this. He says, if I had sneezed, I would not have seen this thing happening. So he's taking himself out of this, not taking him out of the movement, but taking out his ownership of the movement or ownership of the works that have been happening through the movement. Again, building up that unity and saying, this belongs to all of us. This is not just me. This is all of our work. Again, this is the apex of Dr. King and his work and his auditory and rhetorical work, (laughs) his social justice work. And it is perhaps my second favorite speech or second favorite work. My first favorite work, of course, is Letter from Birmingham Jail, Always and Forever, but this is quickly becoming my second favorite because of how he's building this argument, how he's building his theme, how he's building motifs, how he's using anecdotal evidence, how he's using action plans, giving action plans to his audience, giving marching orders, um, and just the historical significance of this being the final thing we hear from Dr. King before he's assassinated the next day. I hope that this helped. Um, I hope it wasn't too terribly long. Let me know if you need anything from me and I will see you next time. Bye guys.